Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time for another Fantasy Friday, Fiction Friday, whatever you want to call it. And today I want to talk about Lord Fowl's Bane. This is the first book in the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant series. There's actually three sets of books. There's a a first trilogy, there's a middle trilogy, and then there's a final Chronicles, which is four books. And this book is a very, very interesting fantasy book. I'm sure some of you have read it, some of you ought to read it, and plenty of you probably shouldn't read it, which may put you on edge a little bit. I'd like to explain why, because it's a very unconventional book in a lot of respects. This is a book that is a deconstruction of the fantasy genre. But while it's being a deconstruction of the fantasy genre, it is a book that's full of meaning. And it's also a book that is really a fairly compelling story of its own right, even while it's deconstructing certain things about fantasy. So it's hard to know what to call it. It's not really postmodern. It's not really deconstructivist. It's not really structuralist or something. It's its own weird uh, kind of black sheep of the fantasy family. So let me explain why some of you shouldn't read this and why I think a lot of people are put off by this story. So early in the story, there is a scene where the main character, Thomas Covenant, gets raped. Stephen R. Donaldson, the author, makes a very interesting choice choosing to have the protagonist do this. It's a very revolting scene, and it's a scene that changes the reader's perception of the character and the reader's attitude towards the character really forever. It's also a scene where I think most readers, if they're really you know, if they're really put off by it, that's probably where they close the book. Because it eliminates what pathos you have for this character. The main character might be considered an anti-hero. In fact, I would consider him an anti-hero, really in the more classical sense, in that he's a hero that doesn't he doesn't embody the typical traits of a hero. He's not virtuous. Rather than him being a, a villain, a bad guy who happens to be the protagonist, there's a lot of interest when you watch an evil character operate through a plot. In some cases, you can even root for the bad guy. But you don't really root for Thomas Covenant because the feelings that are attached to him are somewhere between pathos, which is like pity. He's a pitiable character and just outright revulsion. And when this scene happens in the first quarter of the book where he rapes a 16-year-old girl, it's very sudden, it's very visceral, and it really puts the reader back on their heels because up to that point, you very much pity Thomas Covenant. But after that point, you don't look at him as a weak and pitiable character. You look at him as a bad character. As, uh, as somebody who is revolting. And he spends the rest of the story trying to earn back at least your pity for Thomas Covenant. And I think for me it was successful. I think by the end of the book I pitied him again. And that is important because that sets up the next two books as well. And that event, besides putting the reader on their heels, has massive ramifications for the other characters and the entire world and, uh, and the rest of the series. It's a really... It's a really important event and a big deal and tests in a particular way a philosophy that he, uh, that he has set up. So it's hard to know where to dig in and where to begin with this book, but the main place I want to begin with is with the world building, the way that the world is set up. So first of all, there's two worlds. There's the real world and then there's this world called the land, which is the fantasy world that Thomas Covenant is struggling through. In the real world, which is where the story begins, Thomas Covenant is a leper. He's a man who has a rare and strange disease here in the West called leprosy. And that leprosy ends up defining everything about his life. He's an extremely wretched character at the beginning. He feels he's completely outcast. Nobody wants him in town. But at the same time, we don't quite trust that narrative. He's constantly voicing things to himself, leper, outcast, unclean. But the people in the town don't even really know him. Somebody's paying his bills to keep him from coming into town to pay the bills and keep his leprosy in his house. His wife divorces him and leaves his child, which is a very pitiable thing. Um, 
it's a it's an interesting situation where we're, we're not quite sure why his situation is there. He blames it on leprosy, but there's a little bit of a unreliable narrator when it comes to when it comes to the entire story, especially when it comes to his leprosy. And through that construction of the real world, we have uh, Thomas Covenant expressing all kinds of desires. So he sees these beautiful 16-year-old girls and expresses lust towards them. And at the same time he expresses lust towards them in his mind, he is upset because he is impotent. He is impotent in a literal fashion. He, he can't operate sexually. But he's also impotent in a, in a broader sense in that he can't affect his world. He's unable to walk into town and actually have a social life with any of the people who have cast him out, according to what the dialogue that's going on in his mind. So he sees these, you know, he sees these girls and lusts after them, and he uh, is frustrated that he is impotent in the real world. He wants, uh, wants to have power. He wants to have acceptance. He wants to have all these things, and he's denied all of those things. Then there's an event that happens, and this isn't a huge spoiler, but uh, he's, you know, hit by a car, and he finds himself transported to this fantasy world called the land. And the land delivers him all of the desires that he expresses in the real world. And his limitations of leprosy in the real world, which control him and um, which are kind of butting up against his real world desires. He's like, I'm a leper. I can't, uh, you know, I, I can't live my life like this. I can't ever have these things that people normally have. He's given the opportunity to have them. He's healed of his leprosy. His nerves regenerate in his feet. And indeed, during the rape scene, you find out he is no longer impotent. But the girl whom he rapes is one who is both beautiful and interested in him on some level, like is would be responsive to a romantic approach. Um, now, I'm not sure why Donaldson chooses the age of 16, but it's his choice. And so you can look at that choice as a little bit of the part of revulsion. It's a little bit too young for our sensibilities. And I think... I think the author knows that, and that's part of um, that's part of our kind of revulsion towards the characters. Is he's uh, he's lusting a little bit too young, a little bit outside the the normal limits of of our society. Um, as the as the story continues, he is not only finds out that he is able to perform sexually, uh, he's able to operate sexually at least, his nerves regrow. He's incredibly important in this world, and he's incredibly potent in this world. He has a wedding ring that he refuses to take off, which is to rem which is reminding him in this masochistic way of his failed marriage that, you know, lepers can't have good things. But this white gold ring, which I don't have my white gold ring on <laughs> right now, um, but he he is able to manifest power with this white gold ring. It's called the wild magic, and it creates an unexpected and chaotic and unpredictable effect whenever it's used. He can't control it, and he can't um, he can't use it in a way that is is gives him the control he needs. And that actually signifies everything that's going on in the story because. Thomas Covenant is out of control of the story. The story is pulling him through it rather than him leading through it. So he's constantly in um, in conflict with this world called the land, which is giving him everything he internally asks for. But at the same time that it's giving him everything that it, he internally asks for, the one thing that he really demands is control over his life, which is what the story does not give him. The story pulls him uh, through its paces all the way until the end, until he turns and decides that regardless of his ability to to alter things, he'll use the magic to, to save the land, which he doesn't believe is real. Um, that's part of the rape scene, by the way, is that he doesn't believe that he's actually in the land. He believes that it's a dream. And so he acts on impulse uh, thinking that there will be no consequences to what he does, and also trying to break the dream. He's constantly trying to test to see whether he's actually asleep, to see whether he can actually ex escape from the dream, whether he's actually physically there. And then, of course, when we actually get to the end of the story, um, I won't spoil it too much, but all of the tests he constructs are invalid. He cannot 
test the reality of the land, and that is an essential theme that runs through um, this world building of the land. The land also um, has a very interesting culture within it that uh, Thomas Covenant has a lot of friction with. So they are nonviolent to a fault. They've taken an oath to not harm other people. And so when he violates this, this girl, one person attempts to kill him, and that's like a violation of it, whereas the, the girl's mother is like leading him on, and she doesn't know about it. She finds out about it, but she doesn't violate the oath, and, it, and it's torturous for her. So it causes her a great amount of grief. And at the same time, Thomas Covenant wants people to break this oath. Uh, he wants them to prove... Uh, to be to be violent on some level and then he himself ends up embracing it in some ways it's a it's a very interesting world and there's these different casts of people there's people who have control over stone people have control over wood people have control basically over water you know the the giants or shipwrights and you have people who live out with the horses in the plains um, and then you have these lords this few set of lords who are uh, dwindling with their knowledge and trying to to counteract uh, Lord Fowl, who's a kind of a hidden Sauron-like evil. So from these these basic constructions of uh, fantasy, we have a set of philosophies which are constantly testing Thomas Covenant's desire to be part of the land because it gives him what he wants, and his resistance to its reality because he knows once he leaves the land that um, those illusions will hamper his ability to operate as as a leper. So it's a very interesting book. I recommend if you can handle the revulsion of a rape scene, um, you think about at least checking it out because I think there's a lot of meaning there. The entire world is about reflecting on uh, a very twisted man's desires and his inability to know what he actually wants. There are things he says he wants. He has an internal dialogue which expresses certain wants. And then he has a more visceral need which is in rebellion of the of the wants that he expresses uh, through his verbal internal dialogue. It's a very interesting book. I'll talk more about it next week with some of the technical construction elements and uh, maybe we can go from there. But leave me your thoughts down below Lord Fowl's Bane from the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. And uh, of course, you can get my books on Amazon. If you join my mailing list, dbspress.com slash list, you'll get uh, actually a couple free books right now, including my newest Voices of the Void, uh, which is a sci-fi horror book. It's around here somewhere. So check it out, and I'll see you guys next time.